Now I'm pretty sure that the um, next this Saturday and next Saturday we'll see us finishing Farmer Boy and moving on up into hey hey how's it going Terry? Mm -hmm. Moving on up into Little House on the Prairie. Now, I don't know if I told you guys last week, but Beth Shepard has got to stop sending me stuff. God, I love her generous heart, though, way. Eh? She sent us the beautiful snow, the Ingalls Family Railroad, and the hard winter of 1880-81. So when we get to the heart, the long winter, we've got even more information to share. So I'm really looking forward to that. Hey, 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 now I'm going to say hello, and then we're going to get on it. We are going to get on it. Okay, so, oh, all right, so, Little House, whoops, Little House Live, Day 22, Farmer Boy, Chapter 24, A Little bobsled oh my gosh sorry guys i just realized i had a bunch of rice spilled here from my phone howie's phone thing got damp yesterday there we go sorry about that didn't mean to delay all right everybody ready All right. Whoops. Moving on up into... Okay. The Little Bob said, Chapter 24. Snow was falling the next morning when Almanza rode with father to the timber lot. Large feathery flakes made a veil over everything. And if you were alone and held your breath and listened, you could hear the soft, tiny sound of their falling. Father and Almanzo tramped through the falling snow in the woods looking for straight small oaks. When they found one, father chopped it down. Each sorry. He chopped off all the limbs and Almanzo piled them up neatly. Then they loaded the small logs on the bobsled. After they had looked for two small crooked trees, excuse me, after that they looked for for two small crooked trees to make curved runners. They must be five inches through and six feet tall before they even began to curve. It was hard to find them in the whole timber lot. There were no two trees alike. You wouldn't find two alike in the whole world, son, father said. Not even two blades of grass are the same. Everything is different from everything else, if you look at it. They had to make two trees that were little that were they had to take two trees that were a little alike. Father chopped them down and Almanza helped load them onto the bobsled. Then they drove home in time for dinner. Sorry, that's our dessert. <laughs> that afternoon, father and Almanzo made the little bobsled on the big barn floor. <clears throat> First, father hewed the bottoms of the runners flat and smooth clear around the crook of their turned up front ends. Just behind the crook, he hewed a flat flat place on top and he hewed another flat place where the near the rear ends. Then he hewed two beams for cross pieces. He hewed them 10 inches wide and three inches high and sawed them four feet long. They were to stand on edge. He hewed out their corners to fit over the flat places on top of the runners. Then he hewed out a curve in their underneath edges to let them slip over the high snow in the middle of the road. He laid the runners side by side, three and a half feet apart, and he fitted the cross beams on them, but he did not fasten them together yet. He hewed out two slabs six feet long and flat on both sides. He laid them on the cross beams over the runners. Then, with an auger, he bored a hole through a slab, down past the cross beam into the runner. He bored close to the beam, and the auger made a, and the auger made half an auger hole down the side of the beam. On the other side of the beam, he bored another hole like the first. 
Into the holes he drove stout wooden pegs. The pegs went down through the slab and into the runner, and they fitted tightly into the half holes on both sides of the beam. Two pegs held the slab and the beam and the runner firmly together. At one, firmly together at one corner of the sled. In the other three corners, he bored the holes and Almanzo hammered in the pegs. That finished the body of the little bobsled. Now father bore a hole crosswise in each runner. Close to the front cross beam, he hewed the bark from a slender pole and sharpened its ends so that they would go into the holes. Father and Al Almanzo and father pulled the curve ends of the runners as far apart as they could and then father slipped the ends of the pole into the holes. When Almanzo and father let go, the runners held the pole firmly between them. Then father bored two holes in the pole uh, close to the runners. They were to hold the sled's tongue. For the, for the tongue, he used an elm sapling because elm is tougher and more pliable than oak. The sapling was 10 feet long from butt to tip. Father slipped an iron ring over the tip and hammered it and hammered it down till it fitted tightly. Oh, I get it. He slipped the ring down over the end of the post and, and hammered it down till it was tight on the post. Okay. Uh, father slipped an iron ring over the tip and hammered it down till it fitted tightly two feet and a half from the butt. He split the butt in two up to the iron ring, which kept it from splitting any farther. Oh, that's brilliant. He sharpened the split ends and spread them apart and drove them into the holes in the crosswise pole. Then he bored the holes down through the pole and into the ends of the tongue and drove the pegs into the holes. Not nail not drill like he bored yeah and he hewed but i mean he had a hand, he had a hand drill and, a, and an axe pretty much now you got to know that sometimes these pictures are not actually as accurate as the descriptions but i mean that's pretty darn close uh near the tip of the tongue he drove an iron ring an iron spike down through it the spike stuck out below the tongue. The tip of the tongue would go into the iron ring in the bottom of the calf's yoke. And when they backed, the ring would push against the spike and the stiff tongue would push the sled backward. Now the bob sled was done. It was almost chore time, but Al Almanzo did not want to leave his little bob sled until he had a wood rack. So father quickly bored holes down through the ends of the slabs into the cross beams and into each hole, Almanzo drove a stake four foot long. The tall stakes stood up at the corners of the sled. They would hold the logs when he hauled wood from the timber. The storm was rising. The falling snow whirled and the wind was crying with a lonely sound when Almanzo and father carried full milk pails to the house that night. Almanzo wanted to... Almanzo wanted deep snow so that he could begin hauling wood with the new sled. But father listened to the storm and said they would not work outdoors next day. They would have to stay under shelter. So they might as well begin threshing the wheat. <coughs> no electric drills, no nails. Amazing. My father built uh, wooden wingback chairs and a couch like cannonball style and he didn't use any nails at all and then all the beds he made the cannonball beds my dad made never used a nail you know it, it just he said no that's not carpentry right so let's do chapter 25 the threshing and then christmas how about that Chapter 25, Threshing. Oh, awesome, Ginger. Okay. The wind howled and the snow, the snow whirled and the mournful sound came from the cedars. The skeleton apple trees rattled their branches together like bones. 
All outdoors was dark and wild and noisy. But the solid, strong barns were quiet. The howling storm beat up beat upon them, but the barn, barns stood undisturbed. They kept their own warmth inside themselves. When Monza latched the door behind him, the noise of the storm was not so loud as the warm stillness of the barns. The air was quiet. The horses turned in their box stalls and whinnied softly. The colts tossed their heads and pawed. The cows stood in a row, placidly swinging their tasseled tails. You could hear them chewing their cuds. Almanzo stroked the soft noses of the horses and looked longing at, longingly at the bright-eyed colts. Then he went to the tool shed where father was mending a flail. The flail had come off his head. The flail had come off its handle, and father had put them together again. The flail was an ironwood stick three feet long and as big around as a broom handle. It had a hole through one end, and its handle was five feet long, and on the other end was a round knob. Father put a strip of cowhide through the hole in the flail and riveted the ends together to make a leather loop. He took another strip of cowhide and cut a slit in each end of it. He put it through the leather loop on the flail and then he pushed the slits over the knob, over the knob, knobbed end of the handle. The flail and its handle were loosely held together by the two leather loops and the flail could swing easily in any direction. Almanzo's flail was just like father's, but it was new and did not need mending. When father's flail was ready, they went, to, they went to the south barn floor. There was still a faint smell of pumpkins, though the stalk had eaten them all. A woodsy smell came from the pile of beech leaves, and a dry, heavy, and a dry strawy smell came from the wheat. Outside, the wind was screeching and the snow was whirling, but the south barn floor was warm and quiet. Father and Almanzo unbound several sheaves of wheat spread them on the clean wooden floor and spread them on the clean wooden floor. Almanzo asked father why he did not hire the machine that did the threshing. Three men had brought it into the county last fall and father had gone to see it. It would thresh a man's whole grain crop in a few days. That's a lazy man's way to thresh, father said. Haste makes waste. But a lazy man had rather get his work done fast than do it himself. That machine chews up the straw till it's not fit to feed the stock, and it scatters grain around and wastes it. All it saves is time, son. And what good is time with nothing to do? It's a problem with our society today, eh? You want to sit and twiddle your thumbs all these stormy winter days? No, said Almanzo. He'd had enough of that on Sundays. They spread the wheat two or three inches thick on the floor. Then they faced each other and they took the handles of their flails in both hands and they swung the flails above their heads and brought them down onto the wheat. Father struck, then Almanzo's, then father's, then Almanzo's. Thud, 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 thud. It was like marching to the music on Independence Day. It was like, it was like marching to the music on Independence Day. It was like beating the drum. Thud, 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 thud. The grains of wheat were shelling from their little husks and sifting down through the straw. A faint good smell came from the beaten straw, like the smell of the ripe fields in the sun. Before Almanzo tired of swinging the flail, it was time to use the pitchforks. He lifted the straw lightly, shaking it, and then pitched it aside. The brown wheat grains lay scattered on the floor. Almanzo and, fa Almanzo and father spread more sheaves over it, and then took up their flails again. When the shelled grain was thick on the floor, Almanzo scraped it aside with a big wooden scraper. We would call those snow shovels today. And all that day, the pile of wheat grew higher. Just before chore time, Almanzo swept the floor in front of the fanning mill, and then father shoveled wheat into the hopper. Well, Almanzo turned the fanning mill's handle. The fans whirred inside the mill. A cloud of chaff blew out of its front and the kernels of clean wheat poured out its side and went sliding down into the rising heap on the floor. Almanzo put a handful into his mouth. 
They were sweet to chew and lasted a long time. He chewed while, the, while he held the grain sacks and father shoveled wheat into them. Father stood the full grain sacks in a row against the wall. A good day's work had been done. Let's say we run some beech nuts through, father asked. So they pitched beech leaves into the hopper and now the whirling fans blew away the leaves and the three corner brown nuts poured out. Almanzo filled a peck measure, which is a bucket, a normal like three gallon milk pail kind of thing. Almanzo filled a peck measure with them to eat that evening by the heater. When they Then they went whistling to do the chores. All winter long on stormy days, there would be threshing to do. When the wheat was threshed, there would be oats, the beans, the Canada peas. There was plenty of grain to feed the stock, plenty of wheat and rye to, make, to take to the mill for flour. Almanzo had harrowed the fields, he had helped in the harvest, and now he was threshing. He helped to feed the patient cows and the horses eagerly whinnying over the bars of their stalls and the hungrily bleeding sheep and the grunting pigs. And he felt like saying to them all, you can depend on me. I'm big enough to take care of all of you. Then he shut the door snugly behind him, leaving them all fed and warm and comfortable for the night. And he went trudging through the storm to the good supper waiting in the kitchen. Okay. I mean, oh, ow, ow, my arm. Oh, I've been planting celery. My elbow's really bored. It's from lifting that, that elderly man yesterday. It's just my whole back and, and left side's all buggered up. So, um, I mean, do you notice how you know, he said, it's not just a lazy man's way, but would you rather, you know, would you rather sit around and twiddle your thumbs all winter long? Or do you want, you know, stuff to do? But I can hardly think that Almanzo's father would ever run out of things to do. That man and his wife must have worked from, must, what must have worked from dawn till dusk every day, every day, seven days a week. So shall we read? Shall we read Christmas? And that will leave us three chapters, I think. Yes, that'll leave us three chapters for next week, and then Farmer Boy will be done. Stuff to do. Okay, excellent. Christmas, chapter 26. <laughs> Excuse me. For a long time, it's... Oh. For a long time, it seemed that Christmas would never come. On Christmas, Uncle Andrew and Aunt da Delia, okay. On Christmas, Uncle Andrew and Aunt Delia, Uncle Wesley and Aunt Lindy, and all the cousins were coming to dinner. It would be the best dinner of the whole year, and a good boy might get something in his stocking. Bad boys found nothing but switches in their stockings on Christmas morning. Well, in our house, it was cold. Never got a needle. Almanzo tried to be good for so long that he could hardly stand the strain. But at last, it was the day before Christmas, and Alice and Royal and Eliza Jane were home again. The girls were cleaning the whole house, and Mother was baking. Royal could help Father with the threshing, but Almanzo had to help in the house. He remembered the switch and tried to be willing and cheerful. He had, a, he had to scour the steel knives and forks and polish the silver. He had to wear an apron around his neck. He took the scouring brick and scraped a little pile of red dust off it. And then with a wet cloth, he rubbed the dust up and down the knives and forks. The kitchen was full of delicious smells. Newly baked bread was cooling. Frosted cakes and cookies and mince pies and pumpkin pies filled the pantry shelves. Cranberries bubbled on the stove. Mother was making dressing for the goose. Outdoors, the sun was shining on the snow. The icicles twinkled all along the eaves. Far away, sleigh bells faint, faintly jingled, and from the barns came the joyful thud, 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 thud of the flails. But when all the steel knives and forks were done, Almanzo soberly polished the silver. Then he had to run to the attic for sage. 
He had to run down cellar for apples and upstairs again for onions. He filled the wood box. He hurried in the cold to fetch water from the pump. He thought maybe he was through then, a, then he thought maybe he was through then anyway for a minute, but no, he had to polish the dining room side of the stove. Do the parlor side yourself, Eliza Jane, mother said. Almanzo might spill the blacking. Almanzo's insides quaked. He knew what would happen if mother knew about the black splotch been hidden on the parlor wall. He, <coughs> <coughs> he didn't want to get a switch for Chris, in his Christmas stocking, but he would far rather find a switch there than have father take him to the woodshed. That night, everyone was tired and the house was so clean and neat that nobody dared touch anything. After supper, mother put the stuffed fat goose and the little pig into the heater's oven to roast it slowly all night, to roast slowly all night. Father set the dampers and wound the clock. Almanzo and Royal hung, so eat, excuse me. Almanzo and Royal hung clean socks on the back of a chair, and Alice and Eliza Jane hung, hung stockings on the back of another chair. Then they all took candles and went to bed. It was still dark when Almanzo woke up. He felt excited, and then he remembered that this was Christmas morning. He jerked back the covers and jumped onto something alive that squirmed. It was Royal. He had forgotten that Royal was there. But he scrambled over him yelling, Christmas, Christmas, Merry Christmas. He pulled his trousers over his nightshirt. Royal jumped out of bed and lighted the candle. Almanzo grabbed the candle and Royal shouted, Hi, leave that be. Where's my pants? But Almanzo was already ready, running down the stairs. Alice and Eliza Jane were flying from their room, but Almanzo beat them. He saw his sock hanging all lumpy. He set down the candle and grabbed his sock. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first thing he pulled out was a cap, a botten cap. The plaid cloth was machine woven and so was the lining. Even the sewing was the sewing was machine sewing and the earmuffs were buttoned over the top. Almanzo yelled. He could not have even hoped for such a cap. He looked at it inside and out. He felt the cloth and the sleek lining. He put the cap on his head. It was a little large because he was growing. So he could wear it a long time. Eliza Jane and Alice were digging into their stockings and squealing. And Royal had a, Royal had a silk muffler. Almanzo thrust his hand into his sock again and pulled out a nickel's worth of whorehound candy. He bit off the end of one stick. The outside melted like maple sugar, but the inside was hard and could be sucked for hours. Then he pulled out a new pair of mittens. Mother had knit the wrists and backs in, fan in a fancy stitch. He pulled out an orange and he pulled out a little package of dried figs. And he thought that was all. He thought no boy ever had a better Christmas. But in the toe of the sock, there was still something more. It was small and thin and hard. Almanzo couldn't imagine what it was. He pulled it out and it was a jackknife. It had four blades. Almanzo yelled and yelled. He snapped all the blades open, sharp and shining, and he yelled, Alice, look, look, Royal, looky, looky, my jackknife, looky, my cap. Father's voice came out of the dark bedroom and said, look at the clock. They all looked at one another. Then Royal held up the candle and they, candle and they looked at the tall clock. Its hands pointed to half past three. Even Eliza Jane did not know what to do. They had waked up father and mother an hour and a half before it was time to get up. What time is it? said father. Asked father. <laughs> Excuse me. Almanzo looked at Royal. Royal and Almanzo looked at Eliza Jane. Eliza Jane swallowed and opened her mouth. But Alice said, Merry Christmas, father. Merry Christmas, mother. It's, it's 30 minutes to four, father. The clock said tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. Then father chuckled. Royal opened the dampers of the heater and Eliza Jane stirred up the kitchen fire and put the kettle on. The house was warm and cozy when father and mother got up and they had a whole hour to spare. There was, there was time to enjoy their presents. 
Alice had a gold locket, and Eliza Jane had a pair of garnet earrings. Mother had knitted new lace collars and black lace mittens for them both. Royal had the silk muff muffler and a fine leather wallet, but Almanzo thought he had the best presents of all. It was a wonderful Christmas. Did my, uh, hang on a second, folks. I think my thing screen froze. Am I still here? Sorry, folks. Now, I don't know if I told you guys last week. What the hell's going well, on? That shepherd. Got... That was completely off the wall. Sorry, folks. I I have to keep my eye on, on it, so... I apologize. Whoops. I apologize for the um, pause here. Okay. Where was I? Uh, it was a wonderful Christmas. Then Mother began to hurry and to hurry everyone else. There were chores to do. The milk to skim, the new milk to strain and put away. The breakfast to eat, the vegetables to be peeled, and the whole house must be put in order and everybody dressed up before the company came. I would have peeled a whole bunch of vegetables and left them in buckets of cold water the night before. I've done it. <laughs> the sun rushed up the sky. Mother was everywhere talking all the time. Almanza, wash your ears. Goodness mercy, Royal, don't stand around underfoot. Eliza Jane, remember you're paring those potatoes, not slicing them, and don't leave so many eyes that they can see to jump out of the pot. Count the silver, Alice, and piece it out with the steel knives and forks. The best bleached tablecloths are on the bottom shelf. Mercy on us, look at the clock. Sleigh bells came jingling up the road, and Mother slammed the oven door and ran to change her apron and pin on her brooch. Alice ran downstairs, and Eliza, Jan re Eliza Jane ran upstairs. Both of them told Almanzo to straighten his collar. Father was calling to Mother to fold his, to fold his cravat. Then Uncle Wesley's sleigh stopped with a last clash of bells. Almanzo ran out, whooping, and Father and Mother came behind him, as calm as if they had never hurried in their lives. Father, Frank and Fred and Abner and Mary tumbled out of the sleigh, all bundled up. And before Aunt Lindy had handed Mother the baby, Uncle Andrew's sleigh was coming. The yard was full of boys and the house filled with hoop skirts. The uncles stamped snow off their boots and unwound their mufflers. Royal and Cousin James drove the sleighs into the buggy house and then unhitched the horses and put them in stalls and rubbed, them down, rubbed down their snowy legs. Almanzo was wearing his boughten cap, and he showed the cousins his jackknife. Frank's, Frank's cap was old now. He had a jackknife, but it only had three blades. Then Almanzo showed his cousins star and bright, and, and the little bobsled, and he let them scratch Lucy's fat white back with corn cobs. He said they could look at starlight if they be quiet and not scare him. The beautiful colt twitched its tail and came daintily stepping toward them. Then he tossed his head and shied away from Frank's hand thrust through the bars. You leave him be, Almanzo said. I bet you don't dast go in there and get on his back, said Frank. I dast, but I got better sense, Almanzo told him. I know better than to spoil that fine colt. How did it spoil him? Frank said, yeah, you're scared he hurt you. You're scared that puny little, you're scared of that bitty little colt. I am not scared, said Almanzo, but father won't let me. I guess I'd do it if I wanted to, if I was you. I guess you'd, I guess your father wouldn't know, Frank said. Almanzo didn't answer and Frank got up on the bars of the stall. You get down off of there, Almanzo said, and he took hold of Frank's le leg. Don't you scare that colt. I'll scare him if I want to, said Frank, kicking, Al kicking. Almanzo hung on. Starlight was running around and around the stall, and Almanzo wanted to yell for Royal, but he knew that he would frighten Starlight even more. He set his teeth and gave a mighty tug, and Frank came tumbling down. All the horses jumped, and Starlight reared and smashed against the manger. I'll lick you for that, Frank said, scrambling up. You just try and lick me, said Almanzo. 
Royal came hurrying from the south barn. He took Almanzo and Frank by the shoulders and marched them outdoors. Frank and Abner and John came silently after them, and Almanzo's knees wobbled. He was afraid Royal would tell father. Let me catch you boys fooling around those colts again, Royal said, and I'll tell father and Uncle Wesley, and you'll get your hides thrashed off you. Royal shook Almanzo so hard that he couldn't tell how hard Royal was shaking Frank. Then he knocked their heads together. Almanzo saw stars. Let me let that teach you to fight on Christmas Day for shame, Royal said. I only didn't want him to scare Starlight, Almanzo said. Shut up, said Royal. Don't you be a tattletale. Now you behave yourselves or you'll wish you had. Go wash your hands. It's dinner time. They all went into the kitchen and washed their hands. Mother and the aunts and the girl cousins were taking up the Christmas dinner. The dining table had been turned around and pulled out till it was almost as long as the dining room. And every inch of it was loaded with good things to eat. Almanzo bowed his head and shut his eyes tight while father said the blessing. It was a long blessing because it was Christmas Day. But at last Almanzo could open his eyes. He sat and silently looked at that, ta at that table. He looked at the crisp crackling pig lying on a blue platter with, an, platter with an apple in its mouth. He looked at the fat roast goose, the drumsticks sticking up and the edges of dressing curling out. The sound of father's knife sharpening on the whetstone made him even hungrier. He looked at the big bowl of cranberry jelly and at the fluffy mountain of mashed potatoes with butter, belt, butter melting, melting butter trickling down it. He looked at the heap of mashed turnips and the golden baked squash and the pale fried parsnips. He swallowed hard and tried not to look any more. He couldn't help seeing the fried apples and onions and the candied carrots. He couldn't help gazing at the triangles of pie waiting by his plate, the spicy pumpkin pie, the melting cream pie, the rich dark mince oozing from between the mince pie's flaky crusts. Yeah, I'm drooling. He squeezed his hands together between his knees. He had to sit silent and wait, but he felt aching and hollow inside. All grown-ups at the head of the table must be served first. They were passing their plates and talking and heartlessly laughing. The tender pork fell away in slices under father's carving knife. The white breast of the goose, pretty sure goose is all dark meat, went piece by piece from the bare breastbone. Spoons ate up the clear cranberry jelly and gouged deep into the mashed potatoes and ladled away the brown gravies. Almanzo had to wait to the very last. He was youngest of all except for Abner and the babies, and Abner was company. At last, Almanzo's plate was filled. The first taste made a pleasant feeling inside him, and it grew and grew. While he ate and ate, he ate till he could eat no more, and he felt very good inside. But for a while, he slowly nibbled bits from his second piece of fruitcake. Then he put away the fruity slice in his pocket and went out to play. Royal and James were choosing sides to play snow fort. Royal chose Frank and Jane cho James chose Almanzo. And when everyone was chosen, they all went to work, rolling snowballs through the deep drifts by the barn. I saw a snow fort just the other day. It was really cool. It brought back a lot of memories. They rolled till the balls were almost as tall as Almanzo. Then they rolled them into a wall. They packed snow between them and made a good fort. Then each side made its own little snowballs, and they breathed on the snow and squeezed it solid. They made dozens of hard snowballs. When they were ready for, then they, when they were ready for the fight, Royal threw a stick into the air and caught it. When it came down, James took hold of the stick above Royal's hand, and Royal took hold of it above James' hand, and so on to the end of the stick. James' hands. James' hand was last, so James had, had, James' side had the fort. Oh, it must be nice. After all that work and you had to give it away. How the snowballs flew. Almanzo ducked and dodged and yelled and threw snowballs as fast as he could till they were all gone. Royal came charging over the wall with all the enemy after him, and Almanzo rose up and grabbed Frank. 
Headlong, they went into the deep snow outside the wall, and they rolled over and over, hitting each other as hard as they could. Almanzo's face was covered with snow, and his mouth was full of it, but he hung on to Frank and kept hitting him. Frank got him down, but Almanzo squirmed out from under. Frank's head, hit, Frank's head hit his nose, and it began to bleed. Almanzo didn't care. He was on top of Frank and hitting him as hard as he could in the deep snow. He kept saying, Haul or nuff! Haul or nuff! Frank grunted, it, grunted and squirmed. He rolled half over, and Almanzo got on top of him. He couldn't stay on top of Frank's and hit him, so he bore down with all his weight, and he pushed Frank's freight face deeper into the snow. And Frank gasped, Nuff! Almanzo got up on his knees, and he saw Mother in the doorway of the house. She called, Boys! Boys! Stop playing now! It's time to come in and warm up. They were warm. They were hot and panting, but Mother and the ants thought the cousins must get warm before they rode home in the cold. They all went tramping in, covered with snow, and Mother held up her hands and exclaimed, Mercy on us! The grown-ups were in the parlor, but the boys had to stay in the dining room so they wouldn't melt on the parlor carpet. They couldn't sit down because the chairs were covered with blankets and lap robes warming by the heater. But they ate apples and drank cider standing around, and Almanzo and Abner went into the pantry and ate bits off the platters. Then uncles and aunts and girl cousins put on their wraps, and they brought the sleeping babies from the bedroom rolled up in shawls. The sleighs came jangling from the barn, and father and mother helped tuck the blankets and lap robes over the hoop skirts. Everybody called, goodbye, goodbye. The music of the sleigh bells came back for a little while, and then it was gone. Christmas was over. That's a really wealthy family. Yeah, you can tell, eh? Like, you think of the Christmas, the Christmas meals that Laura and them had. And even... Even when uh, they had like, remember after the long winter, they had Christmas in May and they had turkey and they had cranberries and raisins and, and dried apples and all that stuff. It still wasn't anywhere near what these folks put out for just for Christmas dinner. I mean, they ate every day like the Ingalls family would eat at Christmas. You know what I mean? Uh, right above your comment, Carol. Anyway, listen, folks, I have to go finish planting celery and then I have to start cooking Briar's breakfast dinner or birthday dinner. He, we're having breakfast for dinner. I'm making pea meal bacon, bacon, hash browns, eggs, and I've made an apple cinnamon bread pudding for dessert. I was going to make Briar a cake and he said, no, 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 I'm eating healthy and blah, blah, blah. So I made enough bread apple pudding for three of us just in case briar wants some and it's more healthy it's I, I did a video if it turns out because i was slicing the homemade bread because we're eating homemade bread now which i have to bake tomorrow i was slicing the homemade bread and some when how he slices it goes at it goes at an angle he just saws through it right well then you get a half kind of wedge shaped slice if you want a proper slice so i had to you know, I had some left over. So I broke, I you know, the broken bread and I broke it all up in a buttered bowl and mixed some eggs and some cream and sugar. And I covered all the bread with apples and tossed it all with cinnamon and put some pecans on top, some sugar and some butter and into the new way that goes. Pea meal. Pea as in peas and carrots. Meal as in M-E-A-L. It's not, it's not coated in cornmeal. It's actually co coated in uh, yellow pea meal. It is very much like, you know how I have pickled cottage roll and everyone thinks it's, it's like a ham, but it hasn't been smoked. It's pickled, right? Well, a pick, pickled pork shoulder is a pick, is a cottage roll. And pea meal is the boneless loin. Okay. The inside loin that you would make loin chops out of but it's been deboned and you pickle that you pickle that and then you I just bought two loins Howie I just bought two pork loins we can make some pea meal right on great idea 
Uh, I have a video of it on our half acre homestead, pea meal bacon. And a lot of times it, it's really strong flavored when you buy it in the store, but homemade tastes like pea meal did when I was a kid. Nowadays, you can actually taste ammonia in it, but we'll do. Whatever, bot. <laughs> um, pecan is my favorite nut. Well, I can't do walnuts, and we have pecans. Howie doesn't like raisins, so it wasn't going to be apple raisin bread pudding, or he wouldn't eat it, right? I should have put some craisins in it. Anyway, I'm going to let you go. This is Mrs. Wolfie from Reading with Beverly Wolfie. And next Friday or next Saturday, excuse me, at four o'clock, we'll read the last three chapters of Farmer Boy. All right. Take care. God bless. And we'll see you next Saturday. I love you guys.